Well, hello, Door Creek. How are we doing? Good. Good to see y'all. Uh, my name is Ryan Morrison. I am the campus pastor of the DeForest campus, and it's just my pleasure to be here. <laughs> Don't cheer yet. It's so good uh, to be with you here today. DeForest campus, missing you. Uh, thank you, Rob McCartney, for, for hosting you. A lot of you are here right now, so thanks for that. Uh, but those of you who actually are staying and holding on to the fort, bless you guys. And thanks, Rob, for, for hosting there today. Uh, you know, it's actually a really special weekend for us at the DeForest campus. Well, for all of us at, at Door Creek Church. Uh, this weekend, as many of you know, we have, uh, after years of praying and, and sacrificing, well, not me, <laughs> but <laughs> other people uh, who have been going before me, which I'm very, very grateful for, uh, we are breaking ground on our new facility uh, this weekend, and we're so, so excited. We're going to be gathering there and putting shovels in the ground and, and probably getting a little muddy, but it's, it's just going to be awesome. So thanks for praying and giving and, and being a part of that with us. Also want to say uh, hello to our Door Creek family in the chapel. So glad that you're, you're here with us. So I'm a new face around here. Uh, can I introduce you to my family? Well, you don't really have a choice because <laughs> it's going to be on the screen. So here they are. Uh, this is my wife, Bree, and my kids. So from, from your left, thank you, uh, to right, it is Ivy, she is nine years old, August is six, and Silas is 10, about to turn 11, so that's, that's my family. We're really, really excited to be here. We just moved here from Reno, Nevada, that's in Nevada, for those of you who didn't know, uh, and Reno, Nevada is warm, <laughs> and a lot of our friends in Reno were like, you're crazy, do you have any idea how cold it is in Wisconsin, and we're like, yes, we grew up around there. And, you know, they just don't know how invigorating a nine-month winter can be. <laughs> but we're really excited to be here, uh, and we get to be closer to our family as, as well. So we're in the second week of a four-week series called Be the Church, and each week we're just looking at a word picture in Scripture that kind of explains the purpose and, and, and what we're doing with this, when we do this thing that we call Church And last week, my friend John Anderson shared with us from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, looking at the church as a body, the church as a body, with all of these unique parts that somehow work together to do this thing called church. And what we're doing today is we're going to look at a summary of the mission of the church that Jesus gave his disciples in the gospel of Matthew the Gospel of Matthew, so you can go ahead and get turning there. Uh, we're actually going to look at the very last words in Matthew's biography of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, so if you, if you go to like center of your Bible and then turn a little bit to the right, you'll find Matthew, and then keep going, and you'll find Matthew 28, and we're going to start in verse 16, and here we go. It says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So a little bit of trivia about me. I graduated um, from high school as a homeschooler. Okay, I, I feel like that's a little misleading. I should, I should be honest with you guys. Um, I'm pretty sure I graduated from high school as a homeschooler. Um, okay, can I, can I like show you guys something uh, about homeschooling? Any homeschoolers here? Yeah, all right, all right. Uh, okay, so here's a little thing about homeschooling. This kind of lets you into my world. So I'm going to teach you a homeschool high five, okay? So uh, you, you have to participate with me and DeForest and Chapel people. I'm not watching you, but God is. So uh, <laughs> put your hand up like this. Put your right hand up, okay? And then put up your left hand, 
and you just, <laughs> do you get it? It's a homeschool high five because you're the only one in your school, so you have to give yourself, okay, never mind. Uh, homeschooling was actually awesome, so don't get me wrong, I, I loved it. Uh, I got to finish my work early, and I got to spend extra time on stuff that I was actually interested in. Uh, I got to play in a rock band and study piano and get a job and travel all over, and I got to lead in my youth group, and it was, it was great, but one thing that I missed was a graduation ceremony. So that's why I'm like, I'm pretty sure I graduated. I don't know. A graduation ceremony. And you're, we're going to these right now, right? A graduation is, a, is an important milestone where you look back on how far you've come and then you look ahead to where you're going, right? And in a sense, that's what's happening in this passage. It's a milestone in the biblical story where Jesus gives this concise summary of purpose and, and mission to his followers, which includes us today. So after my high school experience, uh, I went to a little school called Bethany College of Missions in Bloomington, Minnesota. And Bethany's a small school that just does one thing. They train missionaries to go overseas and do this thing that we just heard described to us from Matthew. So this passage, we called it the Great Commission. Did that ring a bell for anyone? Yeah? And this was like an anchor to our studies there. We spent years dissecting it and studying it and talking about it. We, we would try to figure out how to do it in the classroom, and then we actually would go to the field and try to figure out how to do this thing we call the Great Commission, this mission of Jesus that he's invited us to. And here's what I found out. It's really easy to understand the mission of Jesus. You could teach it to a child but it's really, really hard to do. It's hard to do. And if you've tried, you know what I'm talking about, right? And maybe you're a Christ follower and you've, you're, you're already tuned in to this mission. If that's you, I'm so happy for you and not jealous at all. Um, but if you're here and you follow Christ, but this, this mission of Jesus is not something that you have integrated into your life, then we want to unpack this for you today. Or maybe you're here, maybe you're here and you're just not really sure about any of this right now. Or maybe you, you're kind of here but you don't want to be here and, and what I just explained to you or what I just read to you from Matthew sounds a little bit like a Ponzi scheme. And, and you're, maybe you're just not going to say yes to anything until you figure it out what it is that Jesus is trying to sell us here what he's inviting us into. So, to help us say yes to Jesus and his mission, I want to bring three questions to this text. Number one, what is this? Number two, why is it so impossible? And number three, what makes it possible? So what is this? Why is it so impossible? And what makes it possible? So first, what is this? And there are three clues that we're gonna look at in the text. And two of them have to do with where they were physically, geographically, when Jesus gave this mission to his disciples. So let's look at verse 16. It says, then the 11 disciples went to where? Galilee, Galilee. good. To the what? Mountain. Mountain, where Jesus had told them to go. So when biblical authors name places uh, where things happened, they're not just adding a little bit of trivia. Okay? These are actually clues that point us to something really, really important that needs to be fleshed out. So here we see that Jesus has given his followers instructions to meet him in this specific place, Galilee, and to understand why this is so significant to the story. We actually have to turn all the way back to Isaiah, who prophesied about it. We're going to look at um, Isaiah chapter 9. It's going to be on the screen here. Here's the prophecy of Isaiah. He said, but in the future he will honor, what? Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. And then it says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. So what does this mean? It means that God's plan was that this promised Messiah would initiate a movement that would bring light and hope to the whole world and it would start in Galilee. And this is surprising. 
This is really surprising because it should have started in Jerusalem. The temple was in Jerusalem. And all of the religious elite and the the teachers were in Jerusalem, but the fulfillment of the world's hope through the Messiah wouldn't come from Jerusalem. It would come from the backwoods farming area of Galilee. So why isn't it happening in Jerusalem? It's because the religious elites had rejected Jesus' claims to authority. They knew all about Messiah. They knew all about what the Messiah was going to be like because they had Daniel chapter 7 in their Hebrew scriptures. And Daniel 7 describes this strong ruler who would have glory and would exercise dominion over the whole earth. And they also had Psalm chapter 2 which described that the Messiah would judge sinners, judge all of the nations with an iron rod and he'd be feared by the whole planet. But like so many, I think, I think well-intentioned, moral people, these religious leaders in Jerusalem somehow forgot that passages like Isaiah 53 also described the Messiah. And Isaiah 53 says that Messiah would be humble and gentle and someone who wouldn't lead through condemnation but through service and sacrifice. So Jesus claimed to be the Messiah but, but he was empathizing and hanging out with partiers and, and prostitutes. And so to these religious leaders, Jesus was this scandal. So they killed him. They crucified him. And Jerusalem lost out. And God wasn't surprised by that. So the Galilee clue tells us that that this moment that we're reading about here in, in Matthew is the initiation of the prophesied movement, but it would it would bypass those who, this is important, who couldn't come to terms with who Jesus really is. So let's look at the second clue. It says that the the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. So if you look through the entire biblical story, you'll notice that there's kind of this mountaintop motif that that happens. Mountaintop experiences. And, And there are almost always these experiences in these times where God lets people in on his big picture plan. So just a few examples. Uh, God blessed Noah on the mountains of Ararat in Genesis chapter eight. In Genesis 22, he blessed Abraham and he promised that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him and his descendants. In Exodus 19, there was Mount Sinai where God said that Israel would be like this, this mediating nation of priests that would mediate for him in the whole world. These mountaintop experiences are places in the biblical narrative where God kind of literally lifts his people out of the valley so they can see where all of this is headed. And I would argue that if those were suddenly deleted or erased from our Bibles, that we wouldn't really know what God was all about. And Matthew, Matthew totally picks up on this. And he wants us to understand that, that this moment is part of the same category those other, as those other mountaintop experiences except for one thing. All those other experiences pointed to God's future promises. But this passage, this was the initiation of those promises. Matthew wants us to get that that Jesus is saying that all that God has promised in the past is from henceforth being set into motion. That now finally the curse of sin would begin to be rolled back and we'd be given a new way to be human through Jesus. So those are the first two clues. And the third that helps us understand what this mission is is found in verse 18. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And when you read heaven and on earth, don't think up where the angels live and down here where we live. Now, heaven and earth is, is what's called in, um, in biblical studies a mirrorism, which just basically means way up there and way down here and everything in between. So Jesus is claiming authority over everything. But the kind of authority he's claiming is really, really important for us to grasp. So 
He's claiming to be the mighty Messiah described in Daniel 7 and Psalm 2, but he's also claiming to be the gentle, self-sacrificing servant of Isaiah 53. It's, it's so important for us to, to understand that when Jesus talks about his authority, he has both of these things in mind. And all week, guys, I've been wrestling with, with this and, and trying to figure out how to put this concept into words. It's so critical. Because here's what I, I believe. I believe that in the tension between these two very, very different descriptions of the Messiah, that in between those things is the heart of the gospel. So Jesus reveals God as he really is, that God is holy and merciful. He's strong and he's gentle. He's a judge and he's a scapegoat. He demands perfection, but he embraces messed up people. I think if you really think about it, the whole world Christian or not, the whole world can be divided into two camps, and each one of them preferring one of those descriptions of Jesus to the other. There are two types of people. There's the religious conservative type, who they embrace the holy judge who demands perfection, and then, they have, and then you have the irreligious liberal types, who tend to prefer the humble servant who embraces sinners. And here's the thing, guys. Both of them are wrong. They're both wrong. Because in embracing one aspect of Messiah over the other, we would be making a terrible mistake. We wouldn't be grasping the fullness of who God is. And because of that, we wouldn't be able to say yes to his mission. So when Jesus says that all authority has been given to him, he's saying that he alone has the right to set the agenda of humanity, and that his authority would determine the mission of his followers. And these clues, all three of these clues together, here's what they're telling us. This right here, this is a royal summons. They're a royal summons. It's a long-awaited initiation of the promised plans of God under the guidance and the care Jesus. That's what this is. So, great. What are, we, what are we summoned to do, right? What's next? In verse 19 and 20, list three aspects of this mission. You can't really divide them, but I think it's, it's helpful to kind of break them down a little bit. So we're going to do this um, hopefully quicker than we did the last three things. So it says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That's one baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's two. And the last one is teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So let's, let's break this down a little bit. So first, they're supposed to go and make disciples. So what in the world is a disciple? Who, just by show of hands, has in the last month outside of church, you know what, let's be generous, the last 10 years outside of church has used the word disciple in a normal conversation? It work? No? One. Wow, awesome, good. Uh, well, it's not really a word that we use much outside of church, and that, that was, you're not, you didn't fail a test by not raising your hand, by the way. Uh, I assumed that you didn't. I, I don't. But, so, it's not a word that we use very often, but the concept is actually really, really familiar. So, a disciple is simply a learner, a follower. A disciple is someone who who identifies with like the behavior and the, the thinking of someone else. So a helpful way to understand it would be today, uh, when we talk about our education, we usually uh, talk about it in terms of the school that we went to, right? So you could say, I went to UW-Madison, or I went to Harvard, and people would laugh at me if I said that. Um, I went to Madison Area Technical College, or I went to Bethany. But in Jesus' day, you described your education in terms of a person, of, of who you followed. And here's the thing, like we're all disciples of something, 
on someone. And when you're a disciple, your life begins to take shape and build around the thinking and the values of that entity that you're following. So what this means about the mission that Jesus is describing is he's saying it's about inviting people to shape their values and their beliefs and their actions around Jesus and his teachings. And there's a lot that's been said about the go part of this verse. So like, Go and make disciples. Okay, Jesus, does that mean that you want me to go to a place, maybe somewhere far away, where they eat weird food and they, they talk funny, and do you want me to go make disciples there? Or, or do we just get to stay here and make disciples around here where it's, it's easier and familiar? And, well, actually, both are, are true. Uh, so this is super serious, guys. Uh, and by the way, when I say this is super serious, it usually means I'm about to tell a joke. Uh, there are two types of people in this world. There are destination people. Uh, yes, destination people. So uh, there are also journey people. But destination people are people like my wife. So my wife is a total destination person. And what that means is she plans our trips to get to where we need to go as quickly as possible. So everyone goes to the bathroom before we leave, no snacks, we are just on our way, no distractions whatsoever. Let me see you, come on. Destination people, don't be shy. Yeah, yeah, I'm married to one, I love, I love you, destination people. But then there are journey people. And that's, that's me. I have so many stories of, of missing turns and being late today that I could tell you, but I'm not going to tell you those because that would be embarrassing. Journey people are distracted by every detail along the way. Why? It's not because we're dumb, I think. It's not because we don't care about where we're going. It's because we just enjoy the journey, right? We like the journey. And we're usually late. And I mean, to be honest, sometimes we don't even get to where we need to go. And it's my personal belief that God has used journey people for centuries to teach destination people patience. <laughs> and I told my wife that, and she was like, that is so true. I pray for patience every day. <laughs> so you're welcome. But when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, what he's saying is that in order to make disciples of all nations, some of his followers would need to leave their homes and actually travel to a destination to make disciples, but all of his followers would have to make disciples as they go about their daily lives. Does that make sense? So disciple making is not an isolated component of a Christ follower's life. It's an all-encompassing purpose. It's the one trait that shapes the lifestyle and the activity of the Christ follower. So what that means is that questions like, like where should we live? What degree should I pursue? Where should my kids go to school? What relationships should I prioritize? What should I do with my tax return? When should I retire? Like all of these questions must be shaped by the mission of Jesus. Why? Because he's been given all authority. It's all his. So let's look at baptism really quickly. And, and guys, this is, this is just simple. Baptism is just a symbol of identifying with Jesus and the community of faith. The Greek word for baptism is baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse. And, and the picture is just like taking a cloth and dipping it into a vat of dye. And after you've done that, the cloth actually starts to take on the properties and the color of that dye. And so you pull it out and it's permanently embedded. And it's just identifying with the community of God. So these first two aspects of the mission make sense, I think. It's the last aspect of this mission that I think is by far the most challenging. This third aspect is, is why it's impossible for us to do this. And I'm serious. Like, it's really hard. So let's look at it. Jesus tells his followers, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Everything? Really, Jesus? He's like, yeah, everything. 
Okay, so Jesus gave about 500 commands in Scripture. And some of Jesus' teachings, depending on who you're talking to, are really easy to teach. They sound great. They sound easy to do. But others, not so much. So people who are traditional and religious, they they tend to love Jesus' claims to be the only way to God. They tend to love his teachings about conservative uh, marriage and and divorce and ethical rules on, on sexuality. But they may bristle when he asks us to love our enemies and pray for our leaders even when they persecute us. They struggle with the way Jesus seems to prioritize spending time with partiers and prostitutes. And then you have your more liberal progressive types who may love that Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. Uh, But they're kind of scandalized that Jesus clearly reinforces all that the Old Testament teaches about marriage and sexuality. They may love the way he elevates the poor, but they're baffled that he claims to be the only way to God. You understand what I'm saying? Why this is so difficult? Jesus says, teach it all. And don't just teach it for an intellectual understanding, but he said, teach them to obey these things. Do you get why this is so impossible? I mean, the disciples listening to this were probably like, Jesus, you taught all of that and they just killed you. Like, why do you think you can ask us to do this thing that led to your death? And I don't know exactly what the culture was like in their day, but in our day, it, it seems to treat morality like it's some kind of buffet that you can just kind of choose from. And as long as you're sincere and your opinions are well informed, then you're okay. But Jesus is saying, no, no. In a world of sincere and well informed opinions, I alone have been given authority. And I alone get to define what is right and good. So teach them to obey everything. And this is why we can't do it. The the mission that we're being asked to do is controversial, it's offensive, it's divisive, it's risky. And I'm not even including the fact that a lot of Christians are jerks. Like, obviously, don't be a, a jerk. But even when you're not a jerk, you're still gonna be misunderstood and hated. Sign me up, Jesus, right? And you see this play out in the text a little bit. So looking back at verse 16, it says, then the 11 disciples, wait, wait, what? Scratch, there are 11 disciples. I thought there were supposed to be 12. Yeah, well, there were but there are 11 here. Well, why is that? Well, it's because one of Jesus' closest followers, this man named Judas, fell into league with the religious elite in Jerusalem. He accepted a bribe, and he betrayed Jesus to his death. And this follower of Jesus, who, by the way, spent every waking moment of three years of his life with this person, betrayed Jesus. He betrayed the very one he was claiming to follow. Why? Why would he do that? And here's why it is. It's because Judas couldn't accept that if he was gonna follow Jesus and say yes to the mission of Jesus, that it would mean that he would have to lay down his political convictions, his ethical opinions, and his self-serving ambitions. It was impossible for for Judas to say yes to Jesus' mission. Judas missed the heart of the good news. That that Jesus is not just a holy judge and he's not just a merciful servant, he is both. And that he alone has the right to define what is right and good. Uh, I'm not gonna dismiss you because Jesus' mission is not actually impossible. I hope you picked up on that. It is possible, and we're going to look at why. So let's just pay attention to how this this whole scene played out. Verse 16, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain. Jesus 
showed up, they saw him, and what happened? They worshiped, but some doubted. I love that. It's like so honest, isn't it? It's like so authentic. Like they worshiped, but some doubted. That's great. Like some hesitated. Some couldn't quite bring themselves to worship. So Jesus didn't show up and say, okay, look, losers, um, you guys have barely made it this far. And honestly, I don't even know why I'm about to tell you this, but I'm going to give you this mission that you just can't do. No, he didn't. He didn't say that. He actually didn't say anything, did he? I mean, other than a few who doubted, which really just means they, they hesitated, what did the disciples do? They intuitively fell down and they worshiped. Why? Why did they do that? Well, because their rabbi, their teacher, who just a few days ago was a ragged corpse hanging on a cross, was now walking up to them on two strong legs with a smile on his face. And, and notice, they worshiped first, and then Jesus told them that all authority belonged to him. He didn't come in demanding their allegiance. They willingly gave it to him because he's the merciful judge who just outsmarted death. I mean, isn't that awesome? Listen, our coworkers, our family, our, our prodigal sons or daughters, our kids, our neighbors, they don't care what we know about Jesus. They don't really care. They might act interested, but they don't care. But they will care about why you have given up your life to follow him. So the last thing that I want for us to do is to leave here today feeling condemned or guilty or, or burdened. Instead, I want you to encounter the real Jesus and to worship. Because it's only after we've said yes to the real Jesus that we can say yes to his mission. And then the mission becomes a joy, becomes this incredible adventure. But there's something else that makes the mission of Jesus possible, and it's in verse 20. So the, these are the last words. I love this. The last words of Matthew. It's not by accident. It's like, it's like the mic drop of Jesus. He goes, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. When I first read that, I was like, wait, which disciple was named Shirley? <laughs> Just kidding. That, no, that's not true. Uh, and surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. So what does that mean? It means that there is nowhere you can go to make disciples where Jesus isn't already in authority. It means that there's no one that any of us will ever talk to that God isn't already at work at pulling toward himself. As this, this means that there's no fear in the mission of Jesus. There's no rejection that Jesus hasn't already experienced himself and there's no situation where he isn't there with us. He knows who we are. He knows that we don't know enough. He knows that we struggle to find the words. He knows how awkward it is to like strike up a conversation. Come on, it's awkward. Like I don't have a, I, I, all of my like evangelism shirts are stained with sweat of how awkward it is. I don't have evangelism shirts. I, I don't know why I said that. He doesn't expect perfection, but he does ask for obedience. So what did this look like in the early church? Because here we have the disciples, and they, they heard this. They said yes to, they, they worshiped, they said yes to his mission, and then Jesus ascended to the Father, and then the Holy Spirit came on these followers and then something started to happen. And we're just going to really quickly uh, look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. We'll have the words on the screen just to get a sense, kind of a snapshot of what making disciples actually looked like for them. So here's what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and the signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, and they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet um, um, together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So you could almost start to build a list. This isn't like an exhaustive thing, and I I've, have I've no leaders and pastors who make this as an exhaustive description. It's not. I'm not trying to do that. But you can start to build a list and say, okay, what, what do they actually do to make disciples? And here are just a few things. They grew by listening to good Bible teaching. And here we, at Door Creek Church, we call that gather. It's one of the core things that we do. Uh, they hung out together in their homes. And they didn't call them life groups, but that's pretty much what that meant. They prayed for people who were sick and hurting. And here, one of our core values is persistent prayer. They were generous with one another and, and with the people in the community who, who were in need. And one of our values here is contagious generosity, which, by the way, gave the disciples just awesome, awesome reputations. They met in public spaces. They interfaced with the community, which we do here. And God added to the numbers because he was with them. And he's with us. So what does this look like for us? Can we just quickly uh, look at the, the mission of Door Creek Church here? It's crazy how, how well this ties in with this passage we're just looking at. So it says, and let's read it together. Our mission is, to, is joining God in changing people into devoted followers of Christ who change the world with his love. That's the mission here at Door Creek. I just want to close with this encouragement. So, um, I, about a year before we left um, Reno to come here, I started to get to know a guy named Anthony. He was a dad. I met him because a couple of his daughters came to um, an outreach that we had for kids, and they, they both uh, became Christ followers at this outreach. And they wanted to get baptized, so we had this baptism class, and, and kind of the way we roped parents in is we we kind of like forced them to attend this class. And so the cool thing is that God used that class to really get a hold of Anthony and his wife Lacey's hearts. And, and so he was telling me that before, before they, they really encountered Christ, that he and his wife were both working full time. He was a, a department manager at a, at a Whole Foods and she was a school teacher, kindergarten teacher. Um, and they were stressed out of their minds just absolutely stressed out of their minds. Their marriage was in tension. The girls were doing a billion different things, soccer and dance and everything else you can think of. They were obligated to do committees and to volunteer and do all this stuff, and they were being crushed by their obligations, and they needed hope. So after they met Christ, after they encountered the real Jesus, everything changed for them. Everything changed. They started coming to church the whole family got baptized. They began to follow a better leader, Jesus. And they began to recenter their lives around a better mission, Jesus' mission. They started to reevaluate their priorities, and one by one, they were just kind of untangling themselves from all this unnecessary stuff that was distracting them from the mission. Anything that was taking away from their full and joyful obedience to Jesus, they got rid of. And they started serving in the church, in the kids' ministry. They joined a life group, and they began to prioritize their spiritual growth as a family. And it was just beautiful to see this stressed out, broken family just become this healthy family. And the last time I spoke with Anthony, he was just starting to get so pumped about taking all of these these things that he was learning about Jesus and bringing them into his, his, his work and, and kind of reflecting the posture and the tone of Jesus to his team at Whole Foods. And Lord knows they need it. Just kidding. If, if you work at Whole Foods, sorry. And that's, that's just what that looks like. They did it. 
they did it with God and, and so can we. So let's pray. Invite the worship team up. So thank you, Lord, for this, this mountaintop experience. May it show us, Lord, the bigger picture. I pray that we would leave here having said yes to you and to your mission. I pray, Lord, that we would experience such joy and such freedom in saying yes. And Lord, for anyone here who has been trying to say yes, but has been a burden, I pray that they would encounter you afresh right now. Lord, for anyone here who's been unsure and they've hesitated and they haven't given themselves fully to you, I pray that they would do that because you're a better leader and your mission is a better mission. And we love you. And it's in your name that we pray these things. Amen.